Two months after Twitter is banned in Nigeria, the Nigerian government and Twitter utter no words on the removal of restrictions. And on the request of the proscription of a fanfare, a group tells CNG not to provoke another civil war. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anakul. Today marks the second month of the Twitter ban in Nigeria and still there seems to be no end in sight as both the Nigerian government and Twitter. The federal government has announced that the suspension of Twitter operations in the country uh, will continue. Apparently they announced it on the 4th of June after a post by President Muhammad Buhari was deleted for a violation of the company's abusive behavior policy. By the 5th of June, the suspension was effected by telecommunication companies as Nigerians woke up to a Twitter shutdown across platforms. It has been reported that Nigerians have lost billions of Naira due to this ban. But we're going to talk about the implications of the ban today and what it has cost us as a country. Joining us to discuss this is Shino Fagwiro Byron. He is a legal practitioner. And also joining us is Nelly Kalu. She's a broadcast journalist. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much. Good evening. So I'm going to start with you, Mr. Fagwimo, because you're a lawyer, and yeah. um, it's interesting to realize that we made so much noise about it, and a lot of people went back to using Twitter, you know, through a bypass. Um, but it's been a month and some other days over it, and not, nothing has been said. People hoped that with all the suits against the government, uh, with all the calls that people had made, even, you know, what the ECOWAS court did, that Nigerian government yeah. would have, at this point... Um, you know, reversed the ban or done something about it. But here we are. I mean, two days ago, we were talking about press freedom in Nigeria and the fact that um, free speech has been trampled upon by this government. Why do you think that there's been radio silence for so long? Well, one of the reasons is probably because, you know, Nigeria, the Nigerian government, and all of us, you know, were under the eye of the storm. And there are several issues that have to do with a whole bundle of Nigerian institutions. You have free speech, you have the judiciary, you have security, you have everything that is contained in the fundamental human rights that is being virtually challenged now. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that the Twitter ban came and a series of other things happened that bordered on people's rights. Um, uh, take, for example, the security incidences concerning Sunday Buhu and Kano. I mean, those are extensions of rights of speech. And you will recall that the subject matter that uh, required the banning of, um, you know, or the, the removal of the president's tweet had to do with all these accusations and counter accusations of insurgency. So for me, I think it's like, you know, there are so many issues now that we have to grapple with. It will appear that the issue of the Twitter is just a branch in an entire tree that must be uprooted. That is the deprivation or the trying to gag the press. There are other two, and you will recall that there are two other um, you know, contentious issues in the National Assembly, particularly one having to do with the press. I mean, two having to do with the press. Now, all these belong to the same category. If they unban Twitter, and we still continue to have threats to freedom of speech, we still continue to have threats to security, we still continue to have, you know, uncertainty in terms of the fulfillment of our fundamental rights, then unbanning Twitter doesn't do anything. Hmm. So I believe that the population and a lot of Nigerians are trying to look and, you know, we, we, we are, our focus is more on the, at least I know those who are inclined to the reforms and those who are in the civil rights uh, movement and a number of lawyers, 
you know, that I know, want to look beyond just banning of Twitter. What enables a government to get up one day and make laws or make uh, rules, you know, out of a cuff? It's a violation of the rule of law. So what I'm saying in essence is that the banning of Twitter is a violation of the rule of law, a violation of speech. It could have been the issues the president wanted to address, could have been addressed to the courts, right? Take, for example, the, the guy in, 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 I think it's Bono State or Adamawa State, who got a one-year prison term for being rude or, you know, his, what he said to the president was deemed to be uh, uh, seditious. Mm -hmm. Now, that should never happen. You shouldn't use the state to protect your person when it comes to things like, uh, uh, you know, speeches and utterances against your person. So they all belong to a whole category. And I guess that rather than spend energy on fighting Twitter alone, we have greater battles to fight that if we win, the Twitter thing will be th a thing of the so, past. So, so Mr. Fabio, you're saying telling, so you're get... saying that we should forget about government ever reversing the suspension because they have, um, the AGF had come out to say that they're not stopping Nigerians from using Twitter, um, but he never really addressed the fact that there was a ban. Whether, whether it was constitutional or not is not the case, but they're saying they haven't stopped us from using Twitter. So you're telling me that we should forget about it and deal with bigger issues. I am, because telling, Twitter... you, I am telling you that the government is not talking straight and has never really been talking straight. We have had contradictory policy from this government. We have had contradictions, internal contradictions between ministries, between agencies of this government. The presidency has spoken by the left and the president himself will speak by the right. The attorney general will say something and you have other parts aspects. So, you really don't know where we stand, but what we fundamentally know is that there is a threat to rule of law. There is a graduation towards some form of dictatorship, military dictatorship, of which the use of Twitter is a casualty. Okay. Now, it does not mean that we do not have people who violate you know, the rights to free speech or abuse the right to free speech, but the law provides for redress. And we are saying this government is not taking advantage of that law, but being extrajudicial, extra legal. So we are no longer really under the rule of law, but more like under the rule of women cappers. Mm. I will come back to you because I want to talk more about the rule of law and uh, disobedience to court orders. But let me go to Nelly. Nelly, you're a journalist. Um, as I know that you write a lot, you do a lot of interviews, I see your work. and. At Many journalists may not necessarily use Twitter on a day-to-day, -day, but then you publish most of your stories on social media because now you don't have to go to a newspaper stand uh, to get your stories. You quickly go to Twitter and you get headlines for whatever national daily, and this happens across the world. But let's look at the, what you know, the, the lawyer just said, that you know, we don't necessarily, that we have bigger problems, bigger than Twitter, and we should, not, we should be more worried about the problems that we have as a country. Um, the fact that we have insecurity and people are dying every day. The numbers have become just, you know, you just hear that 10, 100 are dead and then you say, oh, okay. Um, so should we be, should we jettison the idea of Twitter ever coming back? Um, should we also close our eyes to the fact that this is one of the many things that government has done without legal backing? For me, everything is symbolic, you see. So it's, all about symbolism what does a certain action represent and it's quite easy to say that there are bigger issues and i think that's always been the problem with nigeria every time that there is something to consider we always say oh there's a bigger issue there's something else to deal with this is not as big as then we compare to the issues and we forget that everything is a spiral and a reflection of the very next action you're taking let's look at symbolism for instance banning twitter is space where people could speak freely and criticize government and the president is akin to shutting down a newspaper because it has so many opinion pages and half of the opinion pages don't make you look good and so you either shut down the newspaper take it with your license or you burn down the building however you choose to see it that's symbolism. 
using VPN to access Twitter and then saying in a court of law that I haven't banned Nigerians from using Twitter, they can still use Twitter, meaning we can still access Twitter from the back door, is similar to um, people living in, a, in an area where they are, they are locked in and blocked in by insurgents. So you're not allowed to access certain news. You're not allowed to speak in a certain way. And the only way you can do this is to cross the border, legally or illegally, to an area where you have the freedom to do it. Imagine yourself in a Kenya-Somali border area and Al-Shabaab controls that region. And so your access to news and your access to um, verifiable information is to cross somehow to an area that is controlled by government forces, or at least that's free enough to access what they want. That's symbolism. And that's exactly what this Twitter ban is. It's all about symbolism. It's simply doing what you would have done so freely if this was military era, if this was a military space, and just trying to modify it to suit democracy. We do not have bigger issues. Freedom of speech and the right to be is one of the biggest issues. In fact, white people will die and we brush our shoulders about it. White people are unconcerned about applying themselves to the issues in Nigeria. It's simply because we have never lived in an environment where we feel completely free to speak, completely free to critique and hold to question people who are supposed to be our leaders, people who are supposed to be answerable to us, who've never understood that dynamic of leadership. So there's nothing more important because it's symbolic. Everything is symbolic. Mm. I mean, give me an issue today in Nigeria that, that you would say is more important than Twitter ban. Then it means you, you reduce the issues to a very reductive space because now you're looking at it as an isolated space of capitalism and maybe an isolated space of um, uh, millennials or generational uh, divide and misunderstanding of what social media is. But we both know that that's not true. It's a simple case of an ego being robbed the wrong way. And then you shut down because you have the power to. Uh, many, you deprive people of freedom. There are people who also are, are of the opinion that this is how we are as, as Nigerians. And you, you talked about it briefly. The fact that we made so much noise about it, like we were so certain we would get the government to turn, you know, to take down the ban or, you know, um, reverse the suspension. But then, I mean, it's, it's one month plus down the line. And like I said, radio silence. We've moved on to other matters. We literally acted like it's not there. And we can also trace it back to other things. The NSAS, we made so much noise. We screamed, we cried, we talked about it on shows. And then, boom, it died off, swept under the carpet. Could it be that these people, these politicians, these people who lead us, um, have over time realized that we just were very sentimental uh, and it doesn't last, it fizzles out and we'll forget it when they bring something brand new. And so they're taking advantage of that fact and that's why we're here today. Could it also be that maybe this Twitter ban will never go away and we'll find ourselves in a situation where um, other countries like... Um, I mean, other countries that I, I'm not in any way trying to talk down on African countries, but other countries where uh, their social media space is controlled. Uh, do you see us ending up there? Okay, first of all, the reasons for me are a little bit of both, right? And where do I see us ending up? Ugh, it, you can never tell where we're going to end up in Nigeria. I have seen, I mean, in, in my short time being an adult in this country, I have seen us, you know, change mood, and by mood I, mo I mean both economic, political, and um, social, environmental moods the moment um, a new government comes in. So we do know that the government of, of Mohamedou Buhari is not going to be here forever. It's going to come to an expiration point, and for because of democratic rules and edicts, he will be replaced. And that's what's going to happen. Who will he be replaced by? And, and to whom do we turn? We don't know at this moment, as I sit. I don't think you know either, Marianne. And so until then, we can tell where Nigeria is going. It's most likely that this is going to be a political weapon for the opposition party. So we, that's, that might mean that you and I can just posit that we'll be back on Twitter again because someone else would like to look good on this mistake. But however, going back to the questions and the, I mean, to the instances you pointed out, the politicians think we have a short attention span. Probably, I'm not one. And do they think that we'll probably move on um, after a short time? Most likely. Do we really do? Yes, we do. And it's not a lack of concern. It's that we are just a generation that have been born out of the carefulness of our parents. Very careful, 
um, strategic dealing of Nigerian issues. Our parents and most of us were born in an era where journalists were locked in jail, some of them killed. And our parents have lived through wars and they've seen uh, people who speak up against the government losing their freedom, their lives, their families. And yet nothing seems to have happened. No one remembers those who died. I mean, take a look at NSAS. People died and he, it's a political story now. You know, no one remembers those who died. No one remembers those who's lost their freedom. Who's standing in for them? Who's taking care of the families that they left behind? And we grew up around parents who say, oh, no, don't talk too much. Don't do this too much. Don't try this too much. Because there is a palpable um, fear, whether we're in a democracy or not, that has continued to be passed down from generation after generation. And that is why it might seem that there's a short attention span. It's a, it, I wouldn't call it a short attention span particularly. I think I'm going to really say that it's more of a disheartening um, fever. In essence, you want to, you still care, but then there's the depression of acknowledging that nothing is going to be done. Hmm. So you will probably end up a statistic for something that will never change. It takes away the passion of it. But there are still pockets of people everywhere. I mean, there's you, there's me, there's the media and that keeps reminding people. And, and that's what I want to say before I take a pause. And that's that we are journalists. We are the media. It's our job to remind people of what they seem to have forgotten. Nigerian news has never gotten to the point where you say, oh my goodness, are they still talking about this thing? Are we not tired? I don't see it. You see it when you listen to international media, they go on and on and about the thing. And it's not because there isn't any more news, it's because that issue is so valid. It's so important for their freedoms, for their democracy, for who they are, that they have to keep at it mm -hmm. until they get some kind of resolution. And on that, I do not blame on us. We do not quite know our position yet as media, and we need to remember it to keep at it until there's some kind of a resolution. Interesting. Let me come back to you, Fab Mr. Fabian Rowe. Let's talk about yeah. the issues that the federal government made in the first instance. Remember, um, they, yeah. they tried to, they said, in fact, it's not tried, they said that um, government said that the that Jack, that's the owner of Twitter, uh, the CEO of Twitter, was trying to um, unsit the president um, through the NSAS um, protest. That's one of the allegations. Now, there are also pundits who seem to agree with the government that Twitter has had a close shove with many other countries uh, and that there's so, so many other countries, even in the West, who are trying to regulate these social media and that there is some yep. political undertone to all of this, that it's not just about the ego of Mr. President that was bruised. So I want to ask you, as, as, as a lawyer, as someone who sees all the things that happen from a certain prism, is there a political tone to this? Because government has also tried to say that they, um, you know, were trying to get some form of payment of taxes, to earn taxes from Twitter, which they claimed they were going to be having conversations with them for. Uh, hopefully, we will get them to pay for the operations uh, here in Nigeria. But looking at all of that, summing it all up, is there really a political undertone? Could Jack be trying to influence governments through his social media platform? Well, well, the only politicking I've seen is the one that is coming from government. Because the government massively has used Twitter as an instrument. And the issue that brought about this was the government's own handling of a number of things. Um, what was the president's response to people who were agitating for self-determination? And what's his response compared to people who are actually shooting down planes and shooting uh, our men in the armed forces and capturing children? So, it, it, for me, you know, I don't see I mean, Twitter is doing its business. Jack is doing his business. I mean, it's, he's in business. He's making his money. Um, if we want to talk economics, and we say, okay, let's make a bit out of that money and see how we can charge Twitter and all those social handles a bit of, you know, um, uh, something, you know, for their entry to the Nigerian space, that's a totally different matter. So I don't want us to mix apples and oranges. I think... The government is being a bit smarter by half. 
uh, by saying that, because they're, they're the ones playing in politics. But, but, but I'd like to just make a slight correction. Uh, and maybe I came across as saying that Twitter, the banning of Twitter was small and that we could not, we shouldn't sustain it. No, that's not exactly what I was saying. And I do understand Nelia, and I do agree with her, and I want to assure that I am on that same page. What I'm saying is that, you know, there are fundamental things that led to or created the enabling environment for a president to ban Twitter because of his ego. The same reason behind the banning of Twitter has a lot to do with the struggle. For me, the Ensa struggle was inconclusive on our own part. It made its impact, but we thought we could have taken it further. Why didn't we take it further? What was missing? I'm this sorry, how do we take to... it further if people were being shot at? And the government, we can't no, even no, get no, the no, government no, to be no, accountable no, to no, the bullets I, that I'll were being you. shot in the air. Yeah, how do you, yeah, where do you start yeah. to take it further? Can I, can I, yeah. You, you, you see, let me say something. It's a question of strategy. I have lived long enough in this country to, to, to see people's struggle against military, people who have won those struggles, people who have lost, things that I, in retrospect what we could have done. But the answer's issue, let me, let me speak my language. There is a saying in Yoruba called Moja Mosa, which means you know when to strike, you know when to retreat, you have a strategy if you want to, uh, we don't, look, it's not every battle that needs to be fought by noise. And what I'm saying is that the fundamentals, right, that has led to the banning of Twitter, that has led to government, for example, um, treating the answer, take, see what's happened to Abakiari now. It's evidence that everything that was being complained about during NSTAS was a fact about the police. If the police had washed itself up during that period, probably we wouldn't, uh, Nigeria wouldn't be under this disgrace by saying that our super cop is one of the most corrupt uh, policemen on earth. And the point is this, at some point during NSAS, there was a point when the government came to the negotiating table for me, the fact that the NSAS movement did not make a strategic retreat at that time to say, okay, now you're on the table, we give you six months to do this. You know, that was in itself. Now, it, it, it goes with any other battle against a government like this. And the point is this, what I'm saying is that fundamentally, I, you see, anyone who expects a government who has been six years, I know the nature of this president. For crying out loud, I ran against him. I know the nature of this president. He will, he, he's not likely to change. He was, that's what he was in 1984. You get my point. But I think the strategy, right, has to be a little bit different. So what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Say, I'm really curious. Yeah, what strategy yeah, works yeah. for Mr. President? Because I like to work, it's, I like to work to based on facts. It's, Just it's, hold on. Um, I remember, I'm sure you remember this yeah. vividly, when the EFCC boss was not um, confirmed by the National Assembly. Yes. What happened? He stayed on because this is what the president wanted. And now Absolutely. we have a Twitter ban. What's the guarantee that whatever strategy we have would work on Mr. President? And when I say we, I'm talking about the whole of Nigeria and all the people who use Twitter and those who are worried about the, you know, the gag of free speech. Where, what strategy yes. do you presume would work on Mr. President since you seem to know him so well? Okay, for me, for me, I would design a strategy and personalize it for this Mr. President. You see, because I'm not going to expect this Mr. President to change. My strategy will, to make, will be to make sure that nobody like this ever gets near government again. You see, what is on trial is the Nigerian institutions. The way we operate, the way we think, with the way we engage with ourselves. So what if they are on Twitter? Then everything is right, is that it? You know, so what I'm saying is this. Let's keep on keep it, keep the ball bouncing concerning Twitter. Let's remind this government from time to time that you said you were going to unban Twitter. You didn't. Keep that story going. Keep that story going. Well, let's go a bit deeper and see some of the things that 
are connected. Look, since we've been discussing of battery, we've discussed security, we've discussed NSAS. But one thread that is running through it all is the attitude of those who, look, if the president says he's not going to ban it, he's not going to unban it. Doesn't mean I'm not going to use Facebook and I'm not going to use other outlets to communicate and even fight that banning of Twitter. I will use it. So I'll take advantage of those for right now. And then I will see the problem beyond Buhari. The problem is be, it has to be beyond Buhari. Okay. You see, because there are certain attitudes, and I'll tell you, Buhari himself is the, the, the Buhari himself is a, is a, why are people asking for a restructuring, a decentralizing right now? And they are spending their time and energy and lives on that. Because that is a deep-rooted issue that will affect everything. I'm saying, what, which one is more important, the root or the stem? We have to ask ourselves one of the better questions. And that's why, so, but I don't want to be misread as to be belittling, as Nelly rightly said, the symbolism. Because it's a very hard, it's a, well, well, it's a very okay. powerful message. Okay. You know. Well, let, let me go back to Nelly. Nelly, um, I want us to quickly just look at the way forward. We're talking about press freedom. I was on a platform and we were talking about press freedom from different parts of the world and every country had its um, unique challenges. But when it came to the continent of Africa, the lines seemed to be, in fact, it seemed to be very similar across the countries. The governments in on the African continent seemed to want things to go their way. There is not... I mean, the countries that have free speech, you can count them on one hand, and Africa is a really a large continent. So what is that thing that makes us throw up the kinds of people that become our leaders on this continent that at the end of the day um, decide to sit on us or want to, you know, not let us speak when they're not doing what they promised to do for us? And I'm saying that ditto for, I mean, countries like Zimbabwe. We saw what happened uh, in Uganda during the elections. I mean, it, it just keeps happening. What is it? What is the curse of Africa? Why is it that free speech is something, it's a mirage and countries are thinking about how to expand free speech in other parts of the world, but we're still ta talking about, you know, free speech, even given the light of day. What do you think the challenge is? First, I don't think we have a curse for of Africa. I think we're just a country, we're, we're a continent that is just newly experiencing freedom. It's a hard concept and it's a very deep-rooted psychological issue. I mean, it goes beyond just looking at it as politics. And that, that's why I go back to, you know, what we do for a living. We are, as I said before, media, we're journalists. We need to be able to look at the nuances of every issue that we face as Africans and stop speaking about things as if they're just one track. And we are just on one track looking for, this is a good leader, so that's a bad leader. Or this is, it's never going to work that way because we are, we are a fusion of so many things. Take a look at us, Nigeria. How old are we? We just became, you could look at it and say 60 years is so many years. Now, I believe in something that I've always said, which is the fact that you're just beginning something that people have done years ago doesn't mean that you have to make the same old mistakes they made. You learn from people's mistakes. However, human beings are complex. And it takes, uh, it, it takes a different understanding and a layer of things for us to understand where we are. So I, I do not think that Africa is cursed, but I think Africa is still reeling from the admiration of absolute power, right? Absolute power of your own internal monarchs, absolute power of colonialism. You look at it, you understand it, you know exactly what it means to be favored. And so no matter what you say about it, nobody wants to give up privilege. So all that means is when you're in that so-called position of power, you, you now have to impose that on people lesser than you because that's what you truly understand as it is. The idea of leadership, and, and look at it through everything. The idea of leadership through service is not an African ideology. It's not, and I'm not saying it as a root of us. I'm saying it as a consequence of leadership before us. And so this is a pillaged continent and we are in our moments of, you know, psychological reborn. And we have to look at even our politics and everything is that. And then when exactly. people believe in absolute power, you tell them to give people a right 
to speak freely, to question the absoluteness of this power that they've worked so hard to get. It's not something easy that people can let go or people can agree with. But it's something that must continually be challenged because generations pass. Africa is going to come to a point where the generation that saw um, colonialism, that fought for freedom, or the generation that was able to separate themselves from military rule will become leaders. Okay. So we have to keep at it. Okay. I, I want to quickly say this. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when he said, um, you know, NSAS, he spoke about NSAS and how it's being fought, I have to say I agree on one point, that you cannot fight a person with a weapon that they understand. Hmm. You cannot do that. You cannot speak any differently. If there's anything this government understands, and I mean the government of President Muhammadu Buhari, is riots and protests. He saw it happen when he was a military general. He's seen it happen from, I mean, dispensation after dispensation, whether military or, or democratic. They are threatened by it. They do not understand it. And they have only one way of dealing with it. It's violence. Mm -hmm. So why would we, millennials, Gen Z, and whichever other generation after that chooses to question power, do it the exact same way when okay. we know the results of it? Right. Once you. again, we need Thank to deal you. with our issues in a more psychological way. We need to deal with our issues with a true depth of the knowledge of what our issues are and who we are fighting, who we are protesting against. That's the only way we can have any kind of solution. We can't keep talking about our issues right. like it's a novel, you know, on the surface of it. It's just not going to yeah. work. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I, I want to end on that note. Thank you very much. Nelly Kalu is a broadcast journalist. Of course, um, Shino Fagwinro is a legal practitioner. Really great conversation, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, a Northern group uh, wants the FNI Ferret to be prescribed. Another group is not happy about it. So take a listen and come back.